United Kingdom Warning and Monitoring Organization. Under the direct control of the Home Office, the UK WMO was a division of the Fire and Emergency Planning Department. Its field force was made up of the various components of the Royal Observer Corps ROC, under the control of the Ministry of Defence. The Home Office funded 97.5% of the UK WMO expenditure and 90% of the administrative costs of the ROC. The five main functions of UK WMO were 1. Originating warnings of the threat of air attack, conventional and nuclear. 2. Providing confirmation of nuclear strike. 3. Providing an emergency meteorological service for fallout prediction. 4. Originating warnings of the approach of radioactive fallout. 5. Providing regional government HQs, local authority emergency centers, armed forces HQs, nuclear reporting cells, neighboring countries and offshore islands with details of nuclear bursts and a scientific appreciation of the path and intensity of radioactive fallout. Nationally there were some 870 monitoring posts formed into clusters of three or four posts each with a master reporting post, reporting to some 25 group controls who in turn reported to five sector controls. Neighboring group controls were linked by telegraph, telephone and radio, with computer-controlled message switching facilities. The network was designed to stay operational even when parts of it had been destroyed. For this reason there was no overall control station. The air attack warning element would take information from the NATO satellite network and Filingdales in Yorkshire. Process this at Strike Command RAF High Wickham and pass this information on to the police carrier control points. There were 250 of these nationally and BBC control for them to pass the warning to the general public. The warning code used nationally consisted of code read, imminent danger of air attack given by siren and BBC broadcast, code black, imminent danger of fallout given by a maroon, gong or whistle in local BBC stations where still possible, code white, all clear, given by siren and BBC broadcast. Nuclear attack warning system. Nationally. Code named Handel, although probably more infamously known as the four minute warning, in actual fact this was probably more likely two minutes. The UK WMO would pass warning to the public face of the system, which was operated by the emergency teams of the local police force. As is to be explained, in a build up in international tension, the BT speaking clock would have been disconnected and transferred to wartime broadcasting. On detection of an enemy launch either by American satellite or at Filingdales in Yorkshire, a strike command officer at RAF High Wickham would insert his key into a small unit called Operating Unit 1A. The actual original unit in service at RAF High Wickham is now on display at the Imperial War Museum in London. In the event the system should fail at strike command, there was a full back command station, now abandoned and currently up for sale, at Langley Lane in Goosnar near Preston. The selection of strike command locations was to correspond closely with the production of the speaking clock offices at London and Liverpool. On system activation by the strike command officer, using the backbone network of the BT speaking clock, 250 carrier control points across the country, installed in major police stations, would begin to make a hooting sound. Warning would also be passed to the BBC for a pre-recorded warning message to be played. The carrier control units consisted of three telephone handsets, one receiver for RAF High Wickham, one receiver for Goosnar and one as a two-way connection to make contact with the nearest UK WM Group HQ. A police officer would then lift the relevant handset denoted by a flashing light and hear the strike command officer speak the phrase attack warning red twice. The police officer would then replace the handset and also repeat the phrase attack warning red into the unit microphone. 
the police officer's voice would be heard on a voice receiving unit called a WB-1400 replacement to the WB-400. WB stood for warning broadcast positioned in government bunkers, council bunkers, utility company bunkers, fire stations and in more remote parts of the country, libraries, public houses, post offices etc. The police officer would then insert his own carrier control key into the unit thus activating the fixed warning sirens which were called WB-1600s. It was vital that it was remembered to speak the phrase first as the sirens would have drowned everything out worryingly. I am told this happened quite often on test runs. In remote parts of the country on receipt of the attack warning, hand wound sirens were to be used. The handle system was scrapped in the early 1990s and the government has just spent many millions on a brand and new system which now means the attack warning would originate from BBC Television Centre in London. In effect the warning now will be broadcast on television and radio channels. Locally in Leicestershire the air attack warning system during the 1980s was operated by Sergeant Stan Blackford. He explains, there were five carrier control points located in Leicestershire, there was always one carrier for each force division. There had been some reorganisation before arriving at this final set. He continues, CCP 066 was originally located within the Warwickshire Police Area at Nuneaton but the majority of warning points attached to this CCP were in fact located within Leicestershire and as a result in the mid-1980s HQ of the UK WMO agreed that CCP 066 should be relocated to the Leicestershire Police HQ at Enderby. However, as a consequence of this move it was considered appropriate to transfer CCP 070 from Charles Street Police Station in Leicester to Loughborough Police Station. Prior to this 070 was known as Leicester. It is difficult to quantify the number of warning points WB 1400s within a CCP catchment area. For example, CCP-072 had only four power-operated sirens, WB-1600s, whereas CCP-066 had something like 30 or more. Equally, a largely rural area like Oakham-072 had a much higher proportion of warning points, WB-1400s, than urban areas. The actual sighting of WB-1400s and WB-1600s was decided on the audibility ranges of the equipment. What of testing of the system? We tested it every six months. Tests would usually be held on a Wednesday afternoon. I would write to everyone sending them a postcard to be completed. A code word I selected would be spoken at the carrier control point and someone sitting at the WB-1400 would have to note down what the code word was and mark down the strength of the signal. The postcards would then be sent in to me so I could assess if any of the equipment needed attention. If it did I would send a BT engineer, BT had the national contract to maintain the system equipment. What kind of code words did you select? I remember I used tree names for a while such as Oak and Birch but I unfortunately selected Ash one time and considering what we were warning against, some felt this might have been a bad choice. We also had to fire maroon rockets into the air to warn of imminent fallout and thus stocks of these were held at suitable locations. Royal Observer Corps history. Since its inception in 1925 as an integral part of the UK air defence system, the primary role of the Royal Observer Corps ROC, was the recognition and identification of hostile aircraft. With the start of the Cold War and the increasing threat of nuclear attack in the 1950s, the ROC was given the added responsibility of reporting nuclear bursts and monitoring fallout which necessitated the construction of 1,563 underground monitoring posts throughout Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
The ROC was chosen for this new role as the infrastructure and lines of communication were already in place and the personnel involved were familiar with the use of monitoring equipment. Posts were clustered into threes and fours for communications purposes and it was envisaged that Group HQ would pass the information received from each post to sector operations centers where scientists would forecast which areas would be in danger from nuclear fallout allowing civilian and military authorities to decide what services, ports, rail, airfields etc. could remain operational. To give fallout protection, the new monitoring rooms would be constructed underground, usually at the same location as the aircraft monitoring post which usually took the form of a precast concrete, or lit, or brick room often raised a few feet off the ground aid visibility. After exercises during 1956 and 1957 showed the inadequacies of the existing monitoring instruments, the fixed survey meter FSM was introduced in 1958. The indicator unit was mounted on a table and connected to the surface by cable running through pipe on the end of which was fitted the ionization chamber. Unlike its predecessor the Radiac Survey Meter No. 2, the FSM could be operated from within the underground post and could read up to 500 röntgens per hour increasing to more than 5000 röntgens per hour if the ionization chamber was withdrawn down the pipe. The bomb power indicator BPI, was introduced at the same time, consisting of a baffle plate mounted on a steel pipe at the surface. At the base of the pipe, in the monitoring room, an indicator unit with bellows was connected to a pointer. The air overpressure from the blast would pass down the pipe to the bellows with the dial showing pressures of up to 5 pounds per square inch. The third piece of equipment was the Ground Zero Indicator GZI, which consisted basically of a pinhole camera with four holes facing the cardinal compass points. A piece of photographic paper was placed in front of each hole and in the event of a nuclear burst, the image of the fireball would be projected through one or more of the pinholes. From these, the bearings and elevation of the burst could be calculated. The GZI was mounted on a convex metal plate, usually located on top of the vent shaft next to the entrance but it necessitated somebody emerging into the open air to retrieve the sheets of photographic paper. All posts were also issued with hand-operated, sycomic, or carter, sirens and maroons. The sirens were for sounding the red warning, a rising and falling note indicating an imminent air or missile attack and the white warning, a steady note indicating all clear. With the approach of radioactive fallout the black warning was sounded by maroon with a series of three explosions at close set intervals. Communications between posts and group HQs was by GPO telephone lines. A line of telegraph poles halfway across a field are often still visible and give the sight away. And in 1964 the conventional headset and microphone was replaced by Teletalk, an 8-inch square box containing microphone and amplifier. In case of emergencies, all group HQs and one post in each cluster were equipped with the HF radios and radio masts, these posts being known as master posts. In January 1968, the Labour government decided the threat of a nuclear attack had lessened and as part of massive reductions in defence spending, the future of the ROC looked uncertain as other home defence services were being abolished or curtailed. On the 18th of January, a Home Office Minister made the following statement in the House, the ROC will be retained as part of the Warning and Monitoring Organization. It has the task of warning the public of an imminent attack with nuclear weapons and subsequently to warn them of nuclear fallout. The organization also has the ability to provide more detailed information, particularly on fallout, to services, which can make use of it. Therefore we are making an exception to the general principle of winding up volunteer organizations, although there will be some reorganization and reduction to secure economies. Nationwide, the strength of the Corps was to be reduced from 25,000 to 12,500 resulting in the closure of more than half the underground posts. 
prior to this reorganization, there were no limits to the number of observers or volunteers manning any one post, but after 1968, each post was limited to a maximum of 10, comprising a head or chief observer, leading observer who was also the post instructor and eight ordinary observers. This allowed for three shifts, but in reality this number was often difficult to achieve with some of the out-of-the-way posts struggling to attract the minimum complement of three, with observers from other neighboring posts standing in when required. The three observers on duty at any one time were numbered one, two and three. Number one observer was in charge of the post and was responsible for reading and accessing the information from the GZI and the BPI. Number 2 observer was in charge of communications, checking the GZI and BPI readings, reading the FSM and filling in the post log and reporting the readings to group headquarters. Number 3 observer had the unenviable job of changing the photographic paper in the GZI and was responsible for the domestic side of the post. National exercises WARMON, involving the whole corps were held twice a year, usually eight hours on a Sunday. International exercises Intex, were held once a year and involved linking up with other warning and monitoring organizations throughout Europe. These lasted for 24 hours, usually 9 a.m. Saturday till 8 a.m. Sunday involving several changes of crew. There were also one or two core exercises a year, which usually consisted of a rerun of a previous WARMON or Intex. Following reorganization the closing of approximately half the underground posts inevitably meant a less detailed fallout picture. A third and final reclustering took place during the 1980s. Regular training continued through the 70s and 80s but in 1991 it was decided by the Home Office and Ministry of Defense that the ROC would cease active training and the remaining underground posts were closed at the end of September that year. Most of the posts closed in 1968 reverted back to the original landowners while those closed in 1992 were put out to public tender. Nationally, many were snapped up by cellular telephone operators because of the strategic positions on high ground. Royal Observer Corps, Leicestershire there have been 19 ROC posts within Leicestershire constructed between April 1959 and October 1966. The following pages survey the nine rock posts which existed during the 1980s. The sites at Billesden, Bottisford, Colleton, Empingham, Markfield, Melton, Mowbray, Thurliston, Twycross, Uppingham and Wimeswold all closed in 1968 as a result of the scaling down of the service. As can be seen from the UK WMO boundary plan opposite, Leicestershire fell into the Midlands sector control based at Lincoln and was split between Coventry, also known as Rugby, and Bedford group controls. Royal Observer Corps posts were clustered into a collection of three or four posts. The cluster name would come from the master post number in the national grid. The master post was able to make contact with group control via radio. Cold Overton was a master post and paired with posts outside of the county boundary. Buckminster and Harby were in the same cluster but the master post resided outside of the county boundary. The following is a survey kindly provided by Subbridge UK researcher Nick Cutford who also provided the ROC history of all of the ROC posts within Leicestershire. Burstall ROC Post. OS Grid Reference. SK5896107. Date opened December 1964. Date closed September 1991. Location in the middle of the A46, 100 yards west of its junction with the A46, Loughborough Road. Description Demolished. Site completely obliterated shortly after closure when the new A46 was built. Remaining surface structures, none. 
Buckminster ROC Post. OS Grid Reference SK87102-06. Date opened May 1961. Date closed September 1991. Location, on a low mound within an irregularly shaped compound on the north side of a field boundary, on the west side of B676. Description, locked. All surface features remain intact. The top of the access shaft has been rebuilt and a large tour lift hatch fitted. The hatch is locked but can be opened with appropriate tools. Internally the post was flooded to a depth of one foot when visited in December 1999 but a year later the water was found to be two feet deep. Remaining artifacts include rope, cargo net, scythe, large wooden rake, instrument shelf, folding table, cupboard, containing Tommy cookers, plates, plastic mugs, teapot, several KFS sets, soap, scouring powder and a candle holder, a slatted wooden bench seat with vinyl cushions two plastic chairs, at least two pairs of Wellington boots, two mattresses, plastic bin, enamel bucket with lid, two blankets sealed in plastic, one bone dry, one sodden and extremely smelly, two plastic raincoats, battery box, siren crate empty, a homemade maroon simulator and wiring, two magazines and a rack of paper trays and two cloud posters on the wall. In June 2001 the post was pumped dry by Sean Sanders, and further items revealed included the battery box, dustpan and brush, bin, buckets, cutlery and bowls. All items on the floor have been stacked on a higher level and the black mats, made from old colliery conveyor belts, have been relayed and cleaned. Many of the perishable items, like mattresses, furniture etc. are badly decayed where they have been in the water remaining surface structures simulator and wiring two magazines a rack of paper trays and two weather cloud posters on the wall cold overton roc post os grid reference sk8062968 date opened april 1959 date closed september 1991 Location, at the end of a line of telegraph poles on the west side of Cold Overton Road. Description, locked. All surface features remain intact with some flaking of the light green paint. The soil under the concrete apron around the access shaft has eroded badly. A metal dome on the ventilation shaft indicated this was a master post. The hatch is locked but can be opened with a T bar key. Internally much remains including light, siren box, pickaxe, spade, utensils, FSM case, tele-talk, papers, posters, folding table, shelf, cupboard, two mirrors, some BT equipment, copper straps, wiring, fire blanket in its box, BPI baffle plates, battery switching box and two Tommy bars for removing the aerial connection dome. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Fleckney ROC Post. OS Grid Reference. SP6373936. Date opened October 1960. Date closed September 1991. Location in the northwest corner of a field alongside a public footpath, 250 yards north of unnamed Minor Road. External photograph opposite. Description Demolished. All trace of the post has recently been cleared away and there is rubble dumped over the site. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Harby ROC Post. OS Grid Reference. SK7455365. Date opened February 1960. Date closed September 1991. Location, on pastoral land on the south side of Horse Lane near its junction with Waltham Lane, external photograph opposite. Description, locked. All surface features remain intact with a little flaking of the green paint. The hatch is locked. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Lutworth ROC Post. OS Grid Reference. 
SP5203859. Date opened. August 1963. Date closed. September 1991. Location, on the edge of former airfield now a BT complex, just outside the current perimeter fence, 200 yards south of Woodby Lane from the point where the road is gated. Description, demolished. When visited in 1999 the post was still extant on a low mound within a square compound with all surface features remaining intact and the very light green paint in good condition. The top of the access shaft was reconstructed in 1989 and a new larger hatch tall lift fitted. The hatch was locked but could be opened with a tall lift key or a large screwdriver. Internally the post was very well preserved and very neat and tidy. Unusually for a 1991 closure twin bunks remained together with mattresses and mattress covers. Other items included table, shelf, cupboard, two chairs with cushions, tool rack, mirror, light, wiring, BT junction boxes, WB1401 and switching box, tele-talk, Dexian rack, papers, utensils, posters, notice board with notices, battery box, cleaning materials, broom, folding chair, carpet, cloud maps, first aid poster, wash basin, pen and pencil rack full. There were wooden shelves, a light, small cupboard and a second mirror in the toilet recess leaving no room for the chemical toilet. There was a cutlery rack full of cutlery in the main cupboard. In the spring of 2000 the site was level ready for redevelopment. All surface features were knocked down the shaft although the monitoring room was not destroyed and none of the artifacts were removed. The post is a time capsule waiting to be found at some time in the future. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Rears BROC post. OS grid reference. SK6641173. Date opened, July 1961. Date closed, September 1991. Location, on field boundary 75 yards north of Glebe Farm and 200 yards north of Gadsby Road B674. External photograph opposite. Description, demolished. No trace of anything. The post was demolished shortly after closure. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Shepshed ROC Post OS Grid Reference SK4949287 Date opened, November 1960 Date closed, September 1991 Location, in a compound on the south side of Shepshed Road, B588 External photograph opposite Description, locked all surface features remain intact with a little flaking of the green paint. The ventilation shaft has been rebuilt with larger louvers and a new hatch without an internal lock has been fitted. The hatch is welded shut. Remaining. Surface. Stoke Golding ROC Post. OS Grid Reference. SP3984966767. Date opened. May 1960. Date closed. September 1991. Location, at the end of a line of telegraph poles in a rectangular compound, 150 yards along a public footpath running west from Wyken Lane. At a point where the footpath turns south through a hedgerow. Description, welded. All surface features remain intact with some flaking of the green paint. The step has gone. A dome on the ventilation shaft indicates this was a master post. The hatch has an unusual locking arrangement consisting of two large hasps with a hinged metal bar that locks across the top of them. Internally the post is fire damaged and strewn with rubbish but much still remains including twin bunks. 
cupboard, table, shelf, mirror, paper rack, fire blanket box, BT connection box, copper straps along the walls, BPI mount, some papers, two battery boxes, ten jerry cans, rope, sickle, spade, broom, utensils, cleaning materials, notice board, two original canvas chairs and one modern chair. Wiring and a wooden sign which reads, ROC Post 8J1. The post was open when inspected in 1999 but the hatch has now been welded shut. Remaining. Surface. Structures. None. Life inside a Royal Observer Corps post. Retired Earl Schilt and residents Martin and Kathleen Cook were both members of the Royal Observer Corps ROC at the Stoke Golding Post. Martin joined the service in 1959 and Kathleen two years later in 1961. Both served until stand down of the service in October 1991. Martin was one of three keyholders for the post, the others being Coventry Group Control and British Telecom. The post was sealed by two padlocks and to open the hatch also required use of a tiki. A balance weight aided opening of the hatch but still required what Martin described as a good shove. To enter the post meant negotiating a vertical metal ladder dropping some 16 feet but Martin confirmed no one ever slipped and fell. Our record time from sealing the inner entrance door at the base of the ladder, scaling it to the entrance, climbing out, changing the ground zero indicator paper and reversing the PROSS back down was 1 minute 50 seconds. Once inside the post conditions were comfortable and cool in the summer but freezing cold in the winter, you could not have had any heating in such a confined space. Martin explained. He went on, some posts suffered from flooding but we didn't have that problem, so to make life a little more comfortable I carpeted it myself. I was a painter and decorator by trade and could fix most things so I did whatever maintenance tasks I could even the mowing of the grass around the post entrance. There was a set of bunk beds inside but unlike a group control the mattresses were thin and hard. Also, the post light would shine onto the bunk bed so I also fitted a curtain across for shade. During an exercise we would always be in full uniform. Badges on the uniform would show Royal Observer Corps, which proficiency tests you had passed and a number to represent the local group control for your post. We had number 8 on ours to represent Coventry. On a drill we would have to take radiation readings every 5 minutes. To fill the gap between times we would have brought books to read many about planes as that was the common interest between us we were specifically told to avoid playing competitive games. We would also communicate with other posts as we were a close-knit group and we knew other posts observers a cluster meeting was held every three months and so discussed planes with them. They even held a regional and national plane spotting competition in the ROC magazine between posts and we managed runners-up three years on the trot and then ultimately winning the national competition three years running. We even went to Denmark in a sort of international competition against their equivalent ROC body and beat him as well. In terms of staffing of a post we had around 12 observers at the finish but we averaged around 10 during the 1980s. They came from all walks of life. At Stoke Golding we had colliery workers, hairdressers, carpenters, school teachers, personnel managers, all sorts of occupations. You had three observers on duty at any one time and you would rotate between being number one, number two and number three observer every four hours. To ensure you remained competent enough to still be in the service you had to pass a test annually. You were not paid a retainer fee but you got expenses paid, namely £2.89 a day to attend a training course and £1.45 a day to be on an exercise plus mileage costs. All of the payments were in the form of cheque issued from Coventry Group Control. Inside a post we had ration packs and biscuits but we often brought our own food as well. 
There was also a 90-gallon stock of water. We had a Tommy cooker, knives, forks, plates, kettle, teapot, and a set of drinking mugs. We also had a 5-gallon can of petrol but as it was kept in an identical type of can to the water we painted it red to distinguish it. We had a full stock list check sheet to fill in and discrepancies would be reported to Sector HQ, Lincoln. I remember one innovation we brought in was to have a visitor's book which was later adopted nationally. Stoke Golding had no distinguishing marks or signs to show what it was and so locals were more or less unaware of its presence for over 25 years. However, when CND became aware of its location they paid at several unwanted visits we had a group of protesters turn up at one time when we were on exercise and so I went up to talk to them. I pointed out they were a bit late to complain about something that had been there over 25 years. They did manage to break into the post on one or two occasions. Damage was caused to the WB 1400 attack warning receiver and things were taken including all of the toilet roll. They drew the CND logo on the walls in pen and read things such as ROC grave and no war etc. They even painted a great big arrow on the road outside pointing out our existence but the council retarmacked the road the very next day. But not being signposted did present one problem. I recall one time we were called out on an emergency and it was in the middle of winter and so there was snow everywhere. It took us some time to find the post then we had to dig it out. But ultimately the post was there to provide bomb plotting and fallout information under war conditions, most likely nuclear war. It would be similar to a game of Russian roulette who would be on duty should the bomb drop but Martin states, I would have gone, it was our duty. The way I look at it is that it is better to do something than nothing. That was the 1980s but as we entered the 1990s the Cold War was thawing. However, even as late as 1991 the government was still discussing restructuring the UK WMO boundaries. Therefore it was a surprise to some when a letter was circulated in October of that year informing observers that the ROC was to stand down. Martin recalls, I, like some others, had an idea it was coming but it was still a surprise to many. There was no great ceremony about it. We all went to Coventry Group Control where we were thanked for our service and awarded a certificate. A few of us stopped off for a drink together on the way home. Looking back now was the closing of our OC posts premature? I think so. The entire service only cost 1.5 to 2 million pounds pounds a year to run which is peanuts compared to other recent government backed projects such as the football stadium and the dome. We were a professional and dedicated service and I still feel we would be of use today.